Hi, welcome back to another episode of my Compact Portable 3 mini series. Now, this episode was meant to be about replacing the keyboard cable. Unfortunately, I've hit a snag, and I think this is <laughs> this is where my efforts for this compact are really running dry because the memory error that I had previously has come back. So uh, unfortunately I didn't get that fixed as I thought I did in the last episode and it reared its ugly head and well <sighs> let's dive into it. At the end of the last video, if you watched that, I highly recommend you do. Uh, I delved into the memory issues that were plaguing this system uh, that popped up while I was editing, uh, sorry, while I was working on the original video adapter. Um, at the end of the last video, I thought I had solved it, and it was just dry solder joints around the SIM sockets because I reflowed them, and then the memory just started working fine, and it was perfect. Um, and then the more and more I used it, uh, that started not being the case. So after a little bit, it um, started only detecting 512k RAM, and now when you turn it on, same configuration, it just shows this error. Sometimes 22 changes to 0 02, um, but that's all I get, and it doesn't matter what I change, whether I change out the SIMs, uh, whether I change out the onboard RAM, I can't get anything other than that again. So, um, I have had this thing apart for a few weeks now since editing that last video and I have been on and off just poking around um, with no real idea, soldering, unsoldering, cleaning. I even got to the point where I ordered and replaced the actual memory <laughs> sockets with some spares that I found. So these are genuine brand new um, AMP amp brand replacements, new old stock. Uh, that didn't do anything. Uh, I changed the sockets for all of the onboard RAM. That did nothing. I changed the onboard RAM. I've tried like piles and piles and piles of RAM. <laughs> These are all testing fine. These are all healthy, healthy chips. Maybe not after being my hand like this. Um, I've tried a bunch of different sticks. Again, these will test fine. These work. Um, just cannot change it. So. Like I said, on and off, been mucking around with it, getting absolutely nowhere when I should be working on either the keyboard or the hard drive, because those are the next actual projects that I wanted to work on this, until today. So, poking around, I thought, well, you know, it's time to bust out the oscilloscope. Um, just test everything, uh, just poke around again, see what we see. And one thing that I found, which I'll show you now, let me just uh, rearrange this and I'll show you what I found, actually. Okay, so here we have the onboard RAM, my two 256k sticks in the replaced SIM sockets, and the two sockets where some extra RAM showed up. So from what little documentation and, and searching I can find on this on this uh, system, you have, as I explained in the last video, 128k of onboard RAM coupled with 512k from two, two 256 sticks, and that makes up your onboard 640k. These two sockets contain these little guys. So these are MB8264A 100 nanosecond. So this is a 64 by 1, one bit DRAM. I cannot figure out what they are here for. If anyone knows, please let me know because my Google foo is weak on this subject. I just cannot figure it out. Anyway, in the last video, I showed that I desoldered those because they were just extra RAM that I found. Hell, it could be the problem. Um, and one of them disintegrated. It was this one. Uh, as I was pulling it out, it broke, it shattered into a bunch of pieces. And this was the other one that was originally here. So that lives there. And then I have uh, in my sheet of RAM here, I have some alternates. So these are, I don't know, you can barely see. Those are MB8264. These are, they, I mean, they look like they've been re laser etched by uh, Chinese seller or a puller, um, but they do test fine. And these ones are an alternate one, which are KM4164Bs, and these are 120 nanoseconds, so they're a little bit slower, but 
regardless. I've got these uh, same for same replacements that we can pop in a spare one here and that's what was in there just moments ago when I showed you that it was not working. Now, onto what I found. If I pull out the multimeter here and we put it into beepy mode, what I found is, let's find address one on the SIM socket here. So that is pin five, which is one, two, three, four, five. Now, if we check that on the 4464 RAM over here, one of these ones, let's go swap hands. <laughs> we are looking for address one, which is on pin 13. So that is 10, 11, 12, and 13. And you can see we have continuity there, and there, and there, and there, because address one is bust across the entire thing and it just decides the CPU or whatever's memory, accessing memory, the DMA controllers, use the, the CAS, the RAS, the enables a whole bunch of different control lines in order to determine which chip is writing or reading from that address bus at any one at any one point in time. So if we check these guys, address one here on the 4164, address one is on pin seven. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Yep. And then on this one, nothing. Hmm. And address five is the same. It works fine uh, for all the other ones. I think that is pin 12 on the RAM. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There we go. And it is pin 10 on the, these guys. So that one there or that one there. So pins. A1 and A5 on this RAM slot are not connected some, for some reason. But every other pin, all the address buses and everything that else I've tested, I, I went through and I checked every one <laughs> that I could figure out, um, all the commonly bust ones and whatnot, uh, they all seem fine. So at the moment I'm just going to probably jump up A1 to A1 and A5 to A5. Now, I am confident that they are disconnected because I have the magic ability and I stole this the magic ability from Alec over at Tech Connections. I have another one. So this is my other Compact Portable 3 um, that I used for a lot of figuring out. Um, and you can see the stock RAM here. I haven't modified this at all and this system works perfectly. So if we check that again and I'm just going to check between these two. So we want to look at address five here and on this one and they are connected and address one over here and here and they are connected there as well. So they are connected here and they're not on my unit that is broken with a memory error. I'm going to go fix that. So this is the first lead I've had in a few weeks and I just uh, Let's get this off the bench, get the other one down, and uh, don't want to say fix it, but um, <laughs> let's, um, let's see what happens. Okay, soldered. Just put the cover back on so I can rest it on the bench. Power is in. Oh, come on, baby. <laughs> oh. Alright, back to testing. Okay, well, uh, obviously that didn't work, so I went back to the drawing board, tested it again. Uh, grabbed out the other portable and did a whole bunch of tracing. What I was looking for was uh, I actually pulled out the oscilloscope, like I said, and had to poke around those address lines um, at startup and just during operation, or you know, normal operation roughly. And what I was finding was the A1 line is actually sitting low, so it's not actually going anywhere either. So I think there's another broken trace somewhere. So uh, grabbed the other portable, traced it, and I could see that it obviously has that um, address activity on line one, which makes perfect sense. But uh, I traced it out just by using the beeper thingy. You put it on address one, and then I just do a whole bunch of this until I find the culprit. Pretty much the only place that I was able to trace that to, which actually makes sense because it is a memory address line, is over to this 
33 ohm resistor bank. So um, I, can sh I can't actually show you on this one, but it comes to pin and I've <laughs> kind of scrolled my notes here. So address line one goes to R35 on pin eight, which is there. And because this is 33 ohm pairs, so that means that each pair of pins is a 33 ohm resistor. So pin eight, and, and it's a 10 pack, I should say. So pin eight is a 33 ohm resistor to pin seven. Pin nine is a 33 ohm resistor to pin 10. Pin one is a 33 ohm resistor to pin two, and so forth and so on. So pin eight here goes to, through a 33 ohm resistor to pin seven on the same resistor um, pack. And then I was able to trace that resistor, which is that one there, to these 74244s, which is, I think it's that pin there. So, um, now these are octal buffers. Um, I don't know where they come from because I didn't trace it any further, but they basically, when a, uh, there's an A and a Y, and then you've got an output enable, and then when the output enable and the A is high, the Y is high, basically. There's a truth table, and I'll probably show it up on screen, but that's not important because we can see that there is continuity between here and here, but there isn't continuity between here, which is the input pin, and the address one line at all. And it doesn't matter where you go. It's completely broken. But on the other portable, that line is there. So I'm going to yet again run another jumper. I'll probably run it from this guy here because it's the closest. Run a jumper from address line one up to that resistor and then test it again and we'll see. And if that doesn't work, then I'll just keep trying because I just want this to work. All right, back soon. Back again, got that uh, line between the AL1 and that resistor pack. <sighs> Let's give it a shot. <gasps> yes, oh, you can't see, but look. Yes, counting round, counting round, come on, do 640. Ah, oh, no, so we're still stuck on that 512 memory error. Damn, but look at that. So that 220 was a missing address one line. Okay, well this, all these errors are because, well, I don't have, it's not set up and I don't have the connector or the keyboard or anything plugged in, so. But yeah, okay, so now we're gonna have to try to figure out what this memory error is. <laughs> oh, that's insane. Okay, continuing on. Okay, so yeah, just found another deadline. This is A2, and for some reason it's 60 ohms. 54, yeah, 54, look at that. So maybe that line, I don't know if it's this IC leg. Let's take the IC out and test the socket directly. No, yeah, 54 push harder it actually gets worse so there is a bud a deadline under there too that could very well be a broken solder joint or possibly like a, the, the through hole veer is not too good but without another bloody broken line so more bodge wires time it's interesting with this repair is it's in the same area that I bodged there before, so address 1 and address 2, so maybe there's something mm, not too healthy in the board just in this area, but uh, yeah, keep going. Okay, now that that's bodged, test to the other ones. Yeah. 
Gut. Try again. Okay. Let's go. Still, same memory error, which is interesting because now we've got a <laughs> connection that's good. Hmm. Okay, more testing. One hour later, more broken traces have been found. So, a lot of a lot of beeping out of connections here, but um, what I discovered was. Um, Wow, where to start? I thought at first, because I started popping out these chips and running it up, and when I was turning it on, the error code would change like this. So if V57 was missing, the error code would say 000F. V58 was missing, F000. V59 was missing, 00F0. But then if U63 was missing, it said 0400. So that seemed odd. So from there, what I did was I traced U63, verified that all of them, the majority of the pins would connect to other chips around where I'd expect them to go, but the data pins uh, went somewhere else. So the data pins here are 2, 3, 15, and 17. Uh, I think they go to 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Uh, I'll show up a little thing here. They go over to this I see here, U68, which I have actually replaced before because I suspected it for something else. Um, it was fine, but what that does is that is a, let's pull it up again, a octal transceiver. So um, three states, it's bi-directional, it allows that data flow, you know, back and forth. Um, now from there, it is connected to the B side of that. So what we want to do is look at the A side of that chip to see where that data could be transceived from. So, you know, in this case, uh, 68 pin 11 so pin 11 is this one on the end here which is b7 so to find the equivalent to that we want to look for a7 which is pin 9 on the other side here so where does pin 9 on u68 go it goes to this i see down here on pin 9 now what this one is is a 74 f280 and that is a 9-bit parity generator or checker so this one and this one in pair, these two ICs here, they're identical. Check the parity of the onboard RAM because our RAM here has parity. It's built in. That's that third, that's that third chip there. But the onboard RAM does not. So I did a little bit more reverse engineering and beeping out and found all of the relevant pins in there. And I have found that indeed, yes, these two have all of their data lines hooked up to these four pins and then one pin for each. Sorry, these, these parity checkers. One pin for each goes to one of these two ICs to check their parity as well. So this is where it gets interesting. What I found, uh, and this is all reverse engineered again from my other unit there, um, is that pin eight on both of those ICs, these two right here, is what is connected to the data line on pins on chips U21, it's this one, and U27, which is this one, and that is pin. Uh, 14 on each of those and it is pin 8 on each of these but as we can see here if we go beep you in, you go pin 8 here should be connected to pin 14 here which is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 and we get nada and it's not connected to 14 on this one either and vice versa this one is also not connected. So it's almost like there's a break in the board between these two sides. I'm not 100% sure how healthy this board is going to be in, in the long run. But again, more broken traces. So what I need to do is now run some jumpers from pins 8 on these two chips to pins 14 on these two chips and then try it again. Getting closer. Maybe. Hopefully.
Okay, here we are, one more time. So, uh, as you saw, I fixed that those two broken traces again. Um, well, not again, but two additional broken traces. And let's see if we're getting parity now. So, yeah, here we go. Oh no, that's even worse. <laughs> Great. Two hours later. More, more, more. We are missing Kaz on these rams. So this one here, Kaz is here. That goes to Kaz on this sim. And this one is supposed to go to Kaz on this sim. But it doesn't, as you can see. And it also goes to these chips here. Uh, so this Kaz, which goes to this one, will go to this one and this one. And this one will connect to this one and this one, but this pin does not connect to here, nor do these connect over here. So yeah, Kaz on this IC is also missing, so I'll put a jumper between there and here, I think it is. Yep, yeah, so pin two there to pin two on that bottom sim. Bloody hell. It's a bit later. Um, my eyes are honestly tired from looking at this, but uh, got the scope out again, and this time I'll do a little bit of recording to show you what I've found. So uh, you can see that I've got these two RAM chips out, and well, let's have a look at the data line that we just connected. So we've got data out on this guy. If we hop that, we can see a fair amount of data out. <laughs> And that's where it's starting to fail the memory check and it's just going into a loop. Okay, now if we look at the other data out pin for the other memory chip, it looks very, very different. It's held pretty much high the entire time. And then it kind of wobbles around but does really big jumps. Doesn't look at all. Now I verified on the other system that the, the former uh, pattern, this data out pattern, is what it should be doing. This is normal, and the other one is anomalous, but you can also tell that there's no chips in there at the moment, so where is that data outline coming from? Well, uh, as noted, we connected it to uh, this one, goes to pin 8 on this pin here, so if we can verify that, it's doing the same, yep, same weird behaviour. Um, but it's also going to pin 56 of this uh, Fujitsu ASIC, so that's bad, that's uh, 64, 3, 2, 1, 4, 9, 8, 7, 6, so it should be the same here, and it is, looks exactly the same. So now, uh, we're kind of getting to the end of this process, I think, because uh, obviously that data outline is not the cause of the RAM, because the RAM's not there and it looks bad, so it can either I've, I've checked the entire board, both on this one and my other one. It does not go anywhere that I can find. So that signal is either breaking down in this IC, which thankfully is a common 7.4 part, 7.4F280, or it is breaking down in this custom ASIC, which I cannot get a replacement for. So uh, I'm going to pull this guy out uh, and see if that goes away. If it does, then we can just replace that, and hopefully, <laughs> I've said it again, but hopefully that'll do it. If that does not look good again, uh, like that data signal still looks terrible, that means I'm pretty much dead in the water, and this custom part is the fault, and I cannot get that, so kind of scraps this entire motherboard, and I'll have to get another one. Yeah, I hope it doesn't come to that, but um, yeah, let's get this chip out, and uh, I think I can test that in my uh, logic tester, my um, Mini Pro, can do logic chess. I can probably also, maybe the uh, retro chip tester has a tester for that, so let's uh, get it out and give it a test and see what we see. Well, we've got it out, 
So let's um, check if the retro chip tester has seven four two eighty. Too far. Two eight three two two eighty. There you go. Cool. Okay. So let's give it a shot. Oh yeah. I mean no, but yeah. Ooh, there you go. Let's just double check. We are indeed a 74F280. So yes. Put that in again. Run it once more. And it fails the exact same parity check. Cool. Okay, so. Uh, well, yeah, I'm going to have to get one of these. Um, yeah, I guess I'll order one and see what happens when it arrives. I might just give this another double check in my, um, uh, like I said, in the Mini Pro, because I think the Mini Pro can also test these, or it can test 7.4 Logic. Um, and it'll give me the truth table and stuff. I don't know if I can do this because this is a specific type of 7.4. I don't know. I'll check. But yeah, I'm pretty confident if the retro chip tester says it's bad, then it is bad. So um, that's friggin' fantastic news. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Let's um, get one of those, and I guess I'll be back in a little while. Right, so last we left off, um, I was ordering the parody, that uh, 74F280, the 9-bit parody generator checker ICs. Um, and that was actually quite some time ago. Uh, it was about a month ago, actually, because I had to order, I had to find that part, and uh, it's completely obsolete, no one sells it anymore. But I did find a seller in uh, Australia, actually, uh, down in uh, Victoria somewhere, uh, Rockby Electronics. They sent me a tube of 10, and they needed the one, but you know, I will never take not take the opportunity to order more than what I need. And I don't know if you can read there, but these actually have date code of 1988. So these are new old stock and uh, or maybe pulls. Not quite sure, but um, put that in there. Did some more work, and then uh, it didn't work immediately. Um, it showed the same problem as before, same memory error. Um, found some more dead traces, fixed those. I can't remember off the top of my head what happened. Uh, got really despondent about this not working and then caught COVID and was down for quite some time. Um, and when I got back to it, yeah, system board failure. So. It's completely dead now, and I can't get past this. So, here. Yeah. Not great. Um, but, uh, yeah, I uh, choose to not take that as a loss. Uh, I don't think I can ever get this board working. Um, even if I got it working, I got found all of the dead traces, and I'll show you the traces in a second. Um, I think there's something internally wrong with that board. It just, every time I touched it, did something else. Something else broke, and, you know, I was, I only found one problem at a time, or multiple problems sometimes in the one hit, but the problem that I found previously wasn't there earlier when I was testing. It only manifested, ma manifested later as I fixed other things. So I think that board just had internal issues, and maybe, I think they're like a four or six layer board. Maybe some of the internal um, data traces were just gone, and, you know, just just handling the board was enough to, to damage them beyond the point of no return. However, since then, I did find uh, a seller on Facebook Marketplace, I think it was, um, who had a non-working compact portable. So I contacted him, made an offer. Uh, he agreed. I went and picked it up. I've actually got it apart now, but you can see that it was missing the button up here. Uh, pretty scungy all around, uh, the keyboard cable in that same hard condition, and as you can see, pretty dirty inside as well. I've already taken the main board out, of, if you can tell, um, but it does give me the opportunity to get a another main board and a video adapter so the I can put back the borrowed one from my working compact portable into this one and then have a uh, 
possibly working video adapter in my one. So that is excellent because I still have no idea what's wrong with the original video adapter that came with this. But here is the main board. And yes, it does work. Now, uh, when I got it, it did not work. And I was, again, very despondent that it did not work. But what that ended up being was a dead tantalum over here on the 12 volt line. So I just popped that out. I do need to replace that. I've got, uh, since then, I just got an order in from, um, I think, Mouser. Yep. With uh, all the tantalums that I ever, would ever need for this. And the other thing that was wrong was it was booting. So I replaced the tantalum, got it booting. I don't have video for any of this because I was just so over it. But I got it booting. And the first thing that showed up, 512k of memory with a memory. <laughs> and I was just, yeah, I was pretty, pretty upset. Um, did a little bit of debugging and found, and actually this was kind of one of the very first things that, that I spotted. And you can see as a little hint down here, these RAM chips here uh, are MT. And these RAM chips over here are socketed. Got any ideas yet? That's right. It came with two MT4264 uh, for the parity RAM there. And these, if you know anything about uh, Commodore 64 <laughs> repair, these are basically just instant replace. They are pretty much all dead now. So as soon as I saw those and I saw the memory error, I just, pop I didn't even bother. I just popped these out, popped in a socket and popped in these ones, booted it up. And this, to steal from Adrian Black, this freaking works. Two other things. I do probably need to replace the little shield here because you can see it's very rusty and dirty and the uh, serial ports down here because they are very rusty. Uh, I should be able to just desolder those and the ones that are on the board that I cannot repair and just swap them around. Um, and then this board is actually pretty clean after that. Um, and the other thing is it has an AMD CPU, the 12 megahertz, but it also had a, look you know at that, that is the 80287. It's only running at six megahertz, but there is a math coprocessor in this. So that's pretty cool. Um, it also came with a Dallas uh, real-time clock up there, which I was obviously dead, but I've been able to replace with one of my uh, modern replacement thingos. So I can pop that in there as needed. And uh, yeah, this actually boots and I ran some memory tests and it just works fine. So. I'll be back in a second. I'm going to swap this all around and uh, yeah, we'll get this thing booting and oh, hopefully that's the end of my stupid memory errors. So just before I flip that over, uh, I just wanted to show you where I got to with the repairs on the back here. So you can see that quite, it's actually not really showing up that well on camera, but you can see quite a lot of bodges from the other uh, two parity chips here down to the main RAM and then over to the uh, parity checker I see is over here and even over to the main system RAM there to that repair, that um, IC pack. It was just, uh, sorry, the resistor pack. It just needed too much. Uh, and yeah, I don't think this board is long for this world, um, but it does give me a nice parts board. So um, I think most of the ICs in here are actually pretty healthy. Um, and, you know, I would be able to supply these custom ASICs if anyone needs them, I suppose. But um, yeah, this is just gonna go kind of in my parts pile for now. But here he is the good board in situ uh i've got the clock in real-time clock chip the, the new the new memory in there uh some ram plugged in the thingy and i have plugged in the floppy so now this is what we see Perfect. Now I've got the, uh, I think it's the setup disc in there at the moment. It might be diagnostics. I think it's diagnostics. And that should pop up in a moment. There's our diagnostics program. And there is everything it has detected. I don't have the hard drive plugged in, so I won't pick up the hard drive, but it has picked up the uh, processor running at 12 megahertz, the numeric 
math coprocessor, the 287 at 8 megahertz. Uh, oh, it's actually 8. I thought it was 6, but it says 8. There you go. Uh, we got 640k of RAM, a RAM, full RAM, good keyboard, parallel, floppy serial, and the monitor. So yes, that is everything that is currently in there. And if we run the diagnostic tests, and I'm going to run one, let's just run the memory really quickly. And yes, I do want to run the random test. And there is our RAM actually working. Uh, this has been a journey. Now, while that's running, we'll do three passes. Um, I just want to explain that, you know, this main board came from a compact that was basically scrap. The physical case is in terrible condition. Some of the screws on the back have actually broken off. It's cracked in places. The button's missing. Uh, I don't think it had a hard drive. The, the uh, sled. Um, so, you know, I'm not too fussed about taking the parts and the mainboard from that and putting it into this. But that does mean that I've bought three now and I have one fully working one that I bought previously, the one that I was doing the reverse engineering on, this one now, and one for parts. So, um, you know, I didn't want to take the mainboard out of the fully working one because that would be, you know, cannibalizing a fully working system. Whereas this is taking a board that does work after a little bit of work and putting it into another one to revise, you know, to revitalize this system. So, um, but yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm going to stop in the memory journey because I now actually have a main board that's working. I might just do a little bit of uh, cutting here where I uh, take out the dead parts from this, those rusty components, and swap them with the bad components on the uh, original main board. But uh, yeah, um, I do have some other plans for the memory in this system. So not the memory on the system, but the one that goes in this system in regards to an expansion. So if you're interested in seeing how that goes, I am too, <laughs> but uh, stick around, get, rid uh, get subscribed, and uh, I'm sure you'll see something in the future. But now that I'm done with that, I can move on to other projects, including uh, fixing the keyboard, this horrible thing, um, giving it a full clean and getting the hard drive working and seeing if we can recover any of those files. So uh, yeah, I'm going to go have a fiddle with this and see where we get to. So, things sometimes just don't go the way that we planned. Uh, I didn't originally intend on buying an additional two compacts uh, in order to get this one working. Uh, I was hoping to be able to get it fixed up just in the one, but here we are. Um, now the other one, the main board, I am going to be, here it is, maintaining for parts. Um, and you can see all the horrible bodge wires on the back there. Yeah, so that'll go in my spare parts bin. Um, we'll see how it goes. I might eventually be able to try to get it working again, P possibly put some of those bits back, but I don't think it's long for this world. Like I said, uh, there's, there's got to be internal damages. So for now, I've got the compact up and running again. Um, you can see I've got the new quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes here, but my fingers are busy, uh, new mainboard in there. And I just finished putting in these ports and the shield thingy that's there. So, um, yeah, it's booting up even after that soldering work, so I'm thankful that I didn't damage it again. Um, but yeah, now I think the next process I would probably like to tackle is getting the keyboard, and while I'm still doing a little bit of research on what to do with the hard drive. So, um, thanks for sticking about. Overly, this episode was educational because I did dive pretty deep into how I 
uh, found and solved those problems. Um, if you like my content, leave a like and a comment and whatnot. If you didn't, hit dislike. I don't care. It all helps. Uh, if you do have any feedback, I always love to hear it though. Um, but yeah, hope you enjoyed and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.